Today we're doing an amazing podcast with quite an amazing guy, Sam Keck from Common Folk Coffee, who started an amazing program called The Cup That Counts, and he's made a documentary all about it that you can watch, tell all your friends about, and go and see yourself in theatre if you would like to. This story sort of documents Sam's journey with The Cup That Counts and Common Folk's journey purchasing from a single community in Uganda from 2014 to now. The journey's been quite incredible as you'll learn throughout the podcast, but one thing that I really implore you to do is watch the documentary, go and see it with your friends, share it with as many people as you can, because this one is something that's so great for the industry. So please enjoy the podcast. Enjoy, guys. Welcome back, everyone, to the It's Just Coffee Coffee podcast. I'm Kirk Pearson. And I'm Rowan Cook. And together we are It's Just Just Coffee. Coffee. We've got Sam Keck here today. Sam Keck uh, affectionately known as Sam Kekovich. Oh, now, Kekovich. Now, every year around uh, Australia Day, so January 26th in Australia, there's a lamb ad that comes out, and there's a gentleman by the name of Sam Kekovich who produces – they're always pretty good. Um, have you and him ever been seen in the same room? No, we are one in the same. I just look different – um, when I'm doing coffee stuff from meat stuff. Yeah. yeah, okay. If we want to talk about how you're looking, I'm just going to paint a picture for the uh, listeners out there. We've got a good looking rooster right here. He's got some long, luscious locks. Now, I would kind of pitch you, now the coffee makes sense, but I'd almost pitch you more on stage with a guitar around, thinking like some Cold War kids, grunge it up a bit. Have you ever played in a band? Funny story, actually. This is, uh, we're really getting stuck in straight away. Oh, but yeah. I, I had t- t- like sliding doors moment um, when we were going to start Common Folk. A friend of mine who is a musician also invited me to go on tour and play keys in his band that year. And I was like, sorry, I can't. Mm. I'm doing coffee instead. Um, and then I did coffee instead and I'm still doing coffee. Well, there you go. He's so you could muso. have been in that band. We've got a muso behind the desk right hey. here. Um, if no one listened, I know we brought it up, but uh, look up The Voice and Liam Conroy and you'll see him busting out some uh, Harry Styles on The Voice there. His killer voice. Hey, hey. He loves it. Um, have you ever seen that clip on Twitter, Instagram of Bobby Althoff um, interviewing that woman? I can't remember who it is. She's like, what What you call me? No, <laughs> she she accuses her. She's like, you're a musician. Oh yeah, and, yeah. And she's, she's like, like, I ain't no magician. Oh, she thinks she's a magician. <laughs> I have seen that. She's uh, like, I ain't no magician. That she's is one like, of the best things I've musician. ever seen in my life ever. <laughs> yeah. But hey, let's get uh, stuck into it. We'll start off with some coffee news and then interview Sam. Okay, okay. Yeah, and for those listening, and oh, we're into the coffee news. Sweet. Liam up, is too hot on that button. Shut up, Rowan. I just wanted to give the little intro here. I know we said it at the start, but Sam Keck from Common Folk doing some good things with coffee, not only making it, but doing some good for the world. We're going to dive into that a bit later. Mm. And as I just got rudely interrupted, we're going to break into that coffee news. Couldn't couldn't wait. Um, it was It's just too good. But anyway, Bot Rista raises more funds. Super automatic drink equipment maker Bot Rista closed a Series C funding round led by restaurant and retail giant Jollibee Foods Corporation. The latest round brings San Francisco-based equipment company's total capital raise to $120 million since its inception in 2017. According to Bot Rista, its machine-driven cold beverage platform is currently in use, at re- in use at restaurants in 34 US states. So what this thing can do is it can make high-margin, on-trend cold beverages at the push of a button, mixing purees, waters, brews, and other liquids. Bot Rista allows for cold drinks, in more than a dozen categories, including cold brews, teas, juices, fizzy drinks, and cocktail. So this is like replacing every single cafe worker yeah. in one. And so what they're trying to push for is I think that it's going to, they're saying that it's going to bring down that eco cost kind of thing because they're not shipping water and all these like unnecessary things. It's just small amounts of purees and that the water just comes straight from the tap into it. But in Jolly Bees, you're saying, Liam, can we look that up? What is Jolly Bees? What type of cuisine fast food is that again because they must be doing more teas and that than coffee right because jolly bees isn't that like filipino filipino McDonald's, isn't it? Yeah, yeah yeah filipino's mcdonald's you get like pasta and fried chicken i Sweet feel pasta. like yeah. fried chicken fried chicken burgers and pies sam keck's just licking his lips here he's like how many people can i make redundant next week with a, <laughs> with a bod rester <laughs> i've told the team the robots are coming <laughs> yeah oh they're coming i'm sorry that was a joke we had an explicit conversation before the podcast started how that is not a thing but we'll elaborate on that more more detail. You ready for the next one, guys? Absolutely. Hit me with that news. Nestle develops new coffee varietal that they plan to roll out in Brazil. So they're just, you know, creating new varieties here. Multinational food giant Nestle says it has developed a new high-yielding coffee variety called Star 4 while targeting the world's largest coffee-producing market 
Brazil. In announcement of the launch of Starfall last week, the Swiss company said the cultivar has demonstrated relatively high production yields and overall resili- resiliency to pests and disease. The company went a step further to suggest that those factors represent a sustainability win for green coffee sector as a whole, despite the proprietary nature of the development. I'm not going to really address, but... Um, I mean, if I just read, well, uh, my deal or no deal, depending on who the big company was doing this, but as soon as I hear Nestle is doing something, I am saying that they do not care about green coffee or doing any good. They care about their profit margin and what they're making there. And it also feels like we're just going backwards in what we're doing. Come, you know, there was a time years ago when everyone was just trying to do cheap coffee and it was all about which plants were going to get the most yield, the most rust resistant, all those things, just so they could pump out crappy coffee, but a lot of it. And then we've come to a world where we're working with farmers to cultivate better beans. So this just feels like a cash grab to produce more coffee um, and just pump out crappy products. Uh, having said that, though, there are other lab-grown sort of coffee varietals like SL28 and SL34 that are widely used in Kenya and Costa Rica that we all sort of love in the industry as well. I Yes, I agree. I think my big problem comes with just reading Nestle at the start and makes me just always ponder what are the real uh, goals behind this coffee I think Sam Keck's cooking up something here. Oh, Matt, well, well, for me, the issue is the proprietary nature of the coffee. Um, so, like, Nestle owns it. So yeah, they, if, no, no if one's going awesome, to learn the tech. <laughs> sucks to be you guys. And mm. if it's shit, sucks to be everyone who drinks Nestle, which is basically, you know, most of the world's coffee drinkers. So, so lose-lose there on it's both a, sides. It's, it's a what's no from me. What's, like, one thing Nestle makes that's not coffee that's good? They're, they're like, they're in the... Milo. Of, do they do Milo? I think so. Maybe. Okay. Well, oh, they do, they do good. condensed milk. Can we find out is Nestle Milo? Am yeah. I just moving that? I know there's condensed milk because to be honest, whenever we do videos um, on our channel where we are making different drinks, we use condensed milk. If I have the Nestle logo in there, the comment section is just like, stop supporting this evil conglomerate. Yeah. Well, that's condensed confirmed. milk. Yeah. Yeah. Milo. There you go. Milo. Still screw them. Yeah. Yeah. And then uh, Kit, Kit Kat. We'll continue on. Yeah. But we'll look that up. Yeah, I'm a fan. We're just going to spend the whole podcast talking about what does what Nestle own. Nestle I think a better, a better question that might yield like more difficult results to find is what does Nestle not own? Yes, there you go. Okay. I mean, they even bought Blue Bottle. Yeah, Ma- own- major share in common folk. No, I'm yeah. joking. That's not true. <laughs> They I don't remember, want to spend enough trash, money. You remember how I was trash talking Blue Bottle's uh, instant coffee? Yeah. It was probably just Nestle bottled up in a Blue Bottle jar. Oh, yeah, there you go. No wonder it tasted. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. But let's get into it. Sorry, Liam. Did you? Did we? What? What, what did you ask Liam to? Kit Kat. The, Kit Kat. The, yes. Also Nestle. Hey, God damn it! Now I know gonna, my Nestle. Now we're gonna boycott the Kit Kat. Um, all right, Sam Keck. What's your coffee order? Um, a little bit of everything. I've mm. told the team now that they've kind of banned me from making coffee because I just get in the way. Um, to give me what they feel as though I need to taste, which mm. is usually one of everything. Okay. Milk, espresso. Or multiple espresso, multiple yeah, filters. I just did it. I just did it for you here, right? Yeah, thank you. We just it was did delicious. The, what we call the biggie smalls in the industry, which mm. is an espresso and a little milk base next to it. It's a good little tasting board uh, for the barista. I feel like this is what you know how the t- in Italy they all have the espresso at the bar, mm-hmm. and you were talking about it being regulated to being one euro. This should be like the norm in Australia. You know, you give you give them the same side of each shot. Oh yeah, bit of milk, bit of espresso, and it's only like one dollar more or something. Oh, uh, maybe two, but two? you know. Yeah. Yeah, make it make it reasonable on people out there, but um, that could be maybe that should be the new thing. It's a great way to taste it to go like try it black, try it with milk, see the balance. Mm. Sometimes you might get that you know that round where it's great as milk but not great as black, and vice versa. I have someone that comes to the cafe and asks me for this, and they call it the Michael Jackson. (laughs) Why? Why? I just worked out. You can figure out why. I just no, literally just worked out why. (laughs) I was like, why the the hell is he out for that? Don't matter if you're black or white. <laughs> beer, 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 yeah, beer. I feel like everyone should watch the, the video to authenticate that because there was a you know, <laughs> sense of, you see it on his face. The there's a sense of amusement. My, oh shit, how did I get into that? I'm thinking this guy's wacky calling it Michael Jackson. Um, <laughs> all right, so the reason we, were, we asked Sam Keck on the podcast actually is because you've produced a, or part produced, we'll, we'll get you to explain your role in a moment, a documentary about coffee production and kind of like direct trade relationships. Now, Rowan, you weren't here for it, but producer Liam and I were here when Mark Dundon came on the podcast and he's got, um, he, this is kind of the pod, that was kind of the podcast first um, detailed um, or nuanced kind of elaboration on what direct trade is. And now we kind of, uh, 
get a few episodes later, we get Sam Keck on and we get, we've got a whole video that our listeners and viewers will be able to watch. So my question to you is, at what? Let, let's, let's start at the very start. Explain what it is in a moment, but at what point did you just decide that you wanted to make a documentary about this? Yeah, so we had been doing uh, the project that the documentary is about for years, like basically since we started Common Folk um, and obviously it evolved and grew. Um, and I think a lot of people who knew Common Folk broadly knew that we were doing something. Um, it was either to do with, you know, raising money or, you know, something about farmers in Uganda or, you know, ethical coffee, but no one really could articulate it. And it's probably because it is kind of complicated. Now you've watched the docker, you can see how many, you know, like kind of layers to it there is. And so Tommy, um, who's our head of coffee, um, shout outs, um, and myself were sort of discussing how we could do it. And at the same time, our friend Danny, who's a, a filmmaker, you know, photographer, approached us and said, hey, you guys should do more video content. Everyone's doing video content these days and I'm like yeah, I don't know how to do that and he's like well I'll do it and I'm like I can't really pay you to do that um, mm. and he's like well I'll do it cheaply and I'm like uh, how about you do it for free mm. but I pay for you to come to Uganda with this and you actually film a documentary and then when that's awesome maybe you'll get more work from it mm. okay <laughs> um, and surely he gets a stipend from the uh, oh. the number one selling point in the uh, media industry it's like it's just good exposure <laughs> yeah which is what I kind of went with but um, so he's definitely been underpaid for this but he really really I should say he he was a barista in a past life and an incredible guy and um and and he was really really keen to do it because he wanted to come to origin one of the things he never managed to do like a lot of baristas is actually travel to, to origin and understand what's genuinely going on um, and what was the name of him again for uh, danny milligan uh fable films i think is what he's calling his little company but um yeah available for hire um right now at a very cheap price of whatever he charges you. Um, uh, he's very, very good. Um, and he he jumped at the opportunity because he really wanted to tell the story because because um, he was quite good friends with it. He knew intimately what was going on. Uh, but even when he got there, he realized there was so many more layers to it too. And so he said, this would be a great way to be able to share um, how complicated, I guess, the value chain in coffee is. And then also the work that common folks been doing, you know, somewhat, you know, without reward, um, uh, for, for, for many years. Um, and maybe a great example for other roasters or, or cafes or anyone in the industry, um, to, to look at how they can be involved in things like this. Cause it's not, it, it's difficult, but it's also not as difficult as one might think. Um, and so, yeah, then we did it. Um, we captured some footage, uh, uh in one trip over and we realized we probably didn't quite have enough. So I paid for him to go back again. Mm -hmm. Um, and he joined us. Um, we go over there pretty much every year. Um, and, and got some beautiful, beautiful footage. Uh, we got back home, reviewed it all and realized that, you know, what we thought might have been like a little five, 10 minute, you know, snippet. It was probably better placed in like a bit of a documentary form and kind of mm -hmm. came up with a 30 minute expose on, on common folk is the Kookaburra coffee company in Uganda and the cup accounts, which is our charity that's helped. Um, you know, grow and expand that little project. So now give us a recap of how this all works. Because as you said, there's there's a lot of moving parts. But to me, I feel like it's this really cool kind of self-perpetuating machine that just seems to make a lot of sense. It feels like you've got common folk, right? Which is getting the yep. coffee, selling the coffee. Then you've got the cup that counts, which is the organization. Now common folk gives money to that organization. Yep. So the cup that counts is a charity we established. Yep. Um, yep. And then the cup that counts gives that money to Uganda who grow the coffee and then sell it back to common folk who then raise money that goes to the charity, that goes to the farm. So it feels like it makes a lot of sense that it's this kind of perpetual motion of uh, supporting and selling great coffee. We have created a per perpetual motion We've machine. Done it. So <laughs> if, uh, if the oil companies are listening to this and we all disappear, I would not. Yeah, I love my Constant family. My job, yeah, it's like, we, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, um, yeah, that's, that's but that just yeah. feels so yeah. simple and like, why? Okay, of course we should be doing this. Yeah, and I think that the issue is is that there's disconnects at key parts of that transaction for most businesses because, like, most coffee is produced in you know the the, the global south or in the developing economies, um, and most coffee, or at least specialty coffee, is purchased and consumed in you know Western economies um, you know, who who don't produce coffee themselves, and so. Um, even people in the industry, even roasters, even some like sort of importers or people who are say green coffee brokers in Australia and they just buy from agents of, overseas at Origin don't actually know how the coffee is sold and purchased and, and, and where all of that money goes. And so for us, it was just following it all the way back to the source 
figuring out what steps of that process unique to Uganda in this case, because that's the other thing too. Every country is different, so we, we can touch on that later. Um, and figuring out what we could do to, you know, be involved in it. And of course, um, the the benefit of being able to buy the coffee later on when Zakuka Bora, um had, you know, started producing it um, was sort of the cherry on top, but that wasn't yeah. the intent. So I think the intent initially was to support a project that, could lead to something good. Yeah. Um, and then when it did and kind of <laughs> almost got out of hand and grew faster than we expected, um, it was just, you know, like high fives all around and okay, roll up the sleeves now and now we've got to take this genuinely seriously because yep. we've got a proper business going. Yeah, amazing. And I'm, I'm coming in a bit early, you know, off, often we do hot takes on this show, but I'm going to come in with a little hot take right now. Death to specialty coffee. I'm getting something that you guys came up with here. It's all about partnership coffee. What does that mean to you and why is that so important? Oh, I did a rant on this on Instagram. I was really scared to do it because, you know, like coffee, we all kind of know, or well, everyone who's in a know kind of knows where we're bullshitting and the companies that are saying stuff and you're like, yeah, but no. Um, <laughs> and so specialty coffee sort of become this term that, you know, what does it mean? Like it used to be what more than 80 point coffee and then it was 84 and it's sort of people just say that they're specialty coffee, but it was more the idea that specialty coffee was supposed to be good for the farmer and that it was somehow our way out of the bullshit that is, you know, the, the sea price and commodity coffee and the race to the bottom. Um, and my argument is that like specialty coffee didn't do that, isn't doing that, probably won't do that in the way that we'd talked about way back in, you know, the early 2010s when coffee was awesome. Um, but instead, uh, partnership coffee, the idea being that quality is important, but the people come before the quality. And in fact, the quality comes after the people are taken care of. It's like Maslow's hierarchy, you know, like the coffee farmers need to be eating and comfortable and making profit and looking to reinvest in their businesses for them to give a shit about making delicious coffee with some crazy yeast fermentation that we can sell for $100 a kilo here in Australia. And there's an interesting parallel we can draw here because uh, Liam and I w will know and uh, regular listeners to this podcast will know by the time this is released, Mark Dundon came on also. There's a few parallels between you and him that, and kind of outlined that. Dundon is a legend and a hero of mine, by the way. So just, yeah, and just in case he was thinking that he wasn't. Yeah, he's no, never no. met me. Love you, mate. Okay. Well, perhaps we can, you know, make that connection. But My shit's easy as architect also. So next time, get me on the pod. I need to ask some questions about the quality coming out there. But, yeah. Okay, well, you should you should have been here, but no, you had to be, go be in Milan. But you know, there was, and you can chime in as well here, Liam. Like he he drew a lot of parallels here as well. That is kind of like we use this word specialty. Perhaps we need to redefine what it is. Perhaps like perhaps we've got it wrong, and you know, I think people have inj inserted themselves in there that perhaps don't really follow. Maybe specialty needs to have more of a criteria than just tasting above a certain point level. Maybe even reaching a certain level of like social impact. I think like the biggest part of that that moment was the transparency of everything. Mm. You know, well, yeah. Everything was brought forward and he yeah. celebrates it. You know, yeah. there's there's names put to it. There's everything and it's exactly what this doco shows as well. It's beautiful. Yeah, and then that was the idea of partnership coffee, that it was that um we we'd be committing to our producers uh, for the long term. And like again, done it in seeds. He's been doing this for years. Um uh, buying from the same producers every year, not just going to their your favorite importer. And, and again, I think there's a place for importers. I'm not shitting on importers, um, but just going and saying, hey, what spot coffees do you have? Because most importers want long-term commitment too. Like it's good mm. for them, um, but it's connecting yourself with with the place and, and with the people who are producing great coffee and then going, hey, you know what? Rain, hail or shine, we'll stand by you and we'll buy your coffee um, and we'll try and do it in a way that's good for you. Um, and then share that risk. And I, and I think our, my argument has been that every time we've done that, the coffee's gotten better over the years and the relationship's gotten better. And actually it's been, it hasn't been, like, I think that I guess the fear that roasting companies would be, be like, oh, partnership coffee, but what happens if the coffee's bad or what happens if the price goes up? And I'm like, yeah, I mean, like, that would suck for the farmer if they had to do that or it would suck for you, but you navigate that together. Like it's a conversation mm. because it's not like you're just talking to someone who doesn't know you. You're talking to someone who's, in collaboration with you. I think th there's a there's a bunch of things that you said throughout the podcast that I kind of just want to reference the quote if you if I may and then um, ask you a question subsequently. So I'll start off by saying by outlining so you, in the documentary you're working in one particular area of Uganda Mount Elgon is that correct? Yep. And so there's a variety of producers could be smallholders some bigger some smaller and they submit their uh, coffee cherries to a mill where it gets processed and then you pay a larger amount for it. But I'll start you off with this quote. 
In 2014, Zakuka produced 200 kilos of pretty average coffee. The next year, they produced four tons and we bought the whole lot. In 2016, 17, 18, and 19, they pretty much doubled their production every year. So my question to you is, what has it been like to see it grow from where it started to where it is now? And where are some of the biggest, what are some of the biggest challenges you faced along the way? Um, I wrote some points to this. So I didn't end up saying stupid stuff and they seem to have nothing to do with the question, but I'm going to say them anyway. Um, so firstly, a bit of context on Ugandan coffee. Um, it's not, uh, Mount Algon in particular is right on the border of Kenya. And a lot of Ugandan coffee more recently has been being smuggled across the border to Kenya and sold as Kenyan coffee because Kenyan coffee goes for a much higher price. Um, yeah, that sort of gives you an idea of where the Mount Algon specialty industry sort of has been at. Um, and but some actually, blood diamond stuff, putting the diamonds in the sheepskin or whatever and tracking it across. Yeah. Um, and then I've always said to the farmer, I'm like, good on you if you can do that. But it's not normally the farmers doing it. It's usually the guy who bought the cherry off the farmers. That, yeah. Um, but uh, in the 70s, Uganda kind of picked up the slack of, I think, poor, failing Brazilian harvests and was one of the, you know, pr prime Arabica producing countries in the world. It was fetching really good prices and coffee was like Uganda's way to forward. Um, and then through a series of things like um, Idi Amin, you know, very famous sort of uh, dictator who really crippled the country and murdered so many people. Like he kind of, he chipped the coffee industry down a bit. And then when he was ousted and, um, and, and Uganda looked to, to modernize, it sort of went all free market. Um, but again, free market doesn't work if you're a smallholder farmer because it just means that, um, you know, other companies that may or may not have been referenced earlier on the podcast um, probably swoop in and see it as an opportunity to buy, you know, quality coffee, but a really cheap price because they control the, how the system works. And so coffee was just becoming... Something that a lot of people, you know, in rural areas had in their gardens that they could really only sell to, uh, you know, a, a middleman who was usually just a coffee producing company, like a big, big one, a multinational one that would come up on the mountain during the season, say, here's a price for coffee, drop your cherries off, I'll drop your coffee off, we'll buy it, see you later, we might pay you in six months time. Mm. Um, and that was basically the story of coffee. And so, um, Zakukabora wasn't just, uh, which was the company that we helped fund, um, wasn't just a mechanism to to pay more it was actually a mechanism to totally change the system of how it's working so they'd pay on the day they'd pay cash in hand cash in hand That's yeah. it. and that was the big thing so like the farmers were basically like we need cash like you know in fact they probably would have sold to Zakukabora for the same price if they were getting the cash on a day but again that still wasn't you know necessarily enough um and so and in some cases it's like um, like two, three, two, three times the amount of what they were getting before, right? Yeah. So, so, um, and again, this is in Ugandan shillings. So, but initially, fa farmers were getting, let's say, a thousand shillings for a kilo of cherry, um, and now they're getting three thousand. So, like Hell tripled. Yeah. yeah Get over, that over bag. years. Yeah. Seriously. But you yeah. can imagine. Imagine if someone's oh, like, oh, you'll get triple your wage. Yeah. That's insane. And I loved when they were talking about like the whole community is like. Now the people get paid on the certain day and the whole community then comes alive or all the markets open because they know everyone's got the money, they're selling their wares, they're selling their food. And it's like, not only is it like providing like income for people, but it's building that vibe in the actual area. And so you can see how or why it grew so quickly because as soon as other farmers heard that this company was doing this, they're all like, Oh, I get some of that. <laughs> and so, uh, because they're, they're super, uh, this is the other thing too, because of the nature of what's happened in Ugandan coffee over years, the farmers are super, super, super sketchy on anyone coming in with some new thing. Cause they're mm -hmm. like, like for example, we don't call Zakukabora a co-op. It's called a coffee company, not be, but it is a co-op essentially, but because they don't like co-ops because co-ops, that Kenyan style co-op where you, you know, the community leader puts a little board together in the chairman they, they were just rinsing money like the the middleman was right you know like so um, from the farmers yeah so it tainted the idea of a co-op and right. so they preferred this company and so the kookaburra plant had to plant itself in these communities um, but when it did and when they actually followed through paid cash on the day and then also paid a bonus after the season was over and we'd finished paying for the coffee um the farmers were like Hell yeah. yeah. Like we're on board. And then like that's why it kept growing so quickly. See, it started coming in. It's a good thing. And no yeah. one else is no one else is really doing it. Um, certainly not to that scale. And so all of a sudden there was there was enterprise that was worth doing. And following on from what Kirk was just asking there, and I thought it was a really interesting thing that you were talking about, quality and the taste of stuff and how it's done. And actually you said building that, you know. Uh, support and that helps that quality. Because how was your first batch from there? <laughs> I think 
I think I've got footage of um, of uh, myself and Ryan Ryan Tolman, who is our old head roaster. He's got his um, business Long Shot Coffee up in um, Townsville now. Awesome roaster up there. Um, for everyone up in FNQ, um, we I think this he filmed us tasting it, and it wasn't um, and we like it just was like it was it was musty, um, you know it was all washed coffee too because yeah. they really didn't do any sort of experimental processing. It was just washed. They got so much water, so it was never an issue. Um, in fact, their issue is more drying it quickly enough because it's quite wet. Um, and it just it just tasted like like a bad Sumatran or something, you know, yeah. that, like yeah. yeah, it was like it and it was. It wasn't, I, I, yeah, I, I thought even through that, I'm like, there's potential, but I was a bit worried. But again, like I said, the, the, we were never like absolutely set on buying all of the coffee. Um, they didn't have to produce coffee we could buy. It was just, I figured it would be a lot harder. Like his quality was always their thing. They're like, we're going to, we're going to pay more, but we're also going to educate farmers on, on, you know, on process, picking agriculture. Like we want to improve their coffee. We, we see specialty coffee as, you know, at least a mechanism for getting a better price. Cause if you're producing coffee that is just commodity coffee quality, you really not like, no one's going to buy it at the other end of the, you know, the value chain for that price. Yeah. So it was kind of pointless. Um, but to your point, you started with something that was musty and dank yeah. and not very good. And what, a year later, they've doubled the production, a bit of support, a bit of that help in there. And you had a really high level of quality coffee the yeah. very next year. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like legitimately every lot was, well, yeah, it would, would be special. It would have been cupping over 80. Um, Which uh, is an insane transformation. Yeah. It just shows the kind of difference that can be made and how... Yeah, and I think what was as simple as like just really basic stuff that like you know a lot of coffee producers would be listening and be like, yeah, no shit. Um, but like you know, proper raised drying beds, you know, the Kenyan style, African style raised drying beds. Well, you say African style, but like you know, Uganda wasn't doing it. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but uh, like you know, that infrastructure which was funded through the charity, um, uh, a wet mill that processed the coffee the day of delivery rather than kind of letting it sit there, and you know, like um, it's ironic now because sometimes we do intentionally ferment coffee and cherry for, <laughs> but deliberately, um, but you know, like sometimes just be sitting, you know, for a couple of days before it was like, um, was hulled and, you know, just all of these steps, uh, like, you know, tiled, um, uh, uh, tanks to, f to wash the coffee in rather than like concrete, yep. which can absorb, you know, some interesting flavors and different, do, just do different stuff. And, and all these things, uh, again, keep in mind at that stage, we were two years into running a small business. Uh, you know, I was, I wasn't like, I didn't study commerce or anything. I was like 25. <laughs> um, and then I've got a, a company in Uganda that's like, oh, how do you process coffee? Because they didn't really know how to do it either because no one was doing it. So I kind of like, um, and this is another way that we connected with other producers who were may maybe more experienced. I'm like, can I ask you guys questions about how you do <laughs> process coffee? And they're like, why do you need to know that? Yeah, are you going to do it? I'm like, well, yeah, in Uganda. So they won't be competition. It's fine. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. But this, I mean, the amazing thing with this coffee is, Beyond you guys getting to that, it's now being sold into what? Uh, South Korea, uh, Taiwan, into UK, even if someone was going to the Ukraine. So this is feels like it's growing. Do you feel like it's just going to be more and more sought after on that global scale? I mean, that, that, and that's the goal. I mean, I think the key for us is like if we'll sell as much to Kookaburra as we can and we want to share it with Australia, you know, like, and that's our primarily our market. Um, but for them to be a sustainable, successful company, I, I, I'd love to see Zakukabora talked about, like, we talk about, you know, like the Esmeralda Geisha or something. Like, like, you know, if it can get to that level and it can become the kind of thing that people just want a couple of bags of and they're willing to pay, you know, way above market price to get. That's that's where I'd love to see it get to. Yeah. Well, we we had this discussion with Caleb Holstein last week where we kind of believe I believe that coffee is becoming more and more people are getting more interested in it. More and more sort of business entities are getting more into it, and so the I foresee a future where more people are competing for less coffee. Uh, and so you know, I, I, is Sippy Falls part of the Zukuka Zukuka Bora? Uh, yeah, I think I know where you're going with this, and yeah, it is. Yeah, so Zukuka were the first specialty producer to plant themselves in Sippy Falls mm -hmm. year round. And yeah. Sippy Falls is a uh, coffee I see in a number of places. Like there's a number of Australian customers that, that buy that coffee now. So yeah, like 
what what are some of the names? I guess this is uh, an unscripted question. What are some of the names of the coffee that you know it could help people identify that? Listen to this. Um, yeah. So Sippy Falls is probably the big one, um, and Zakuka have yeah have got a site there that like actually it was you know like I mean everything's a cool story, but we can talk about that later. But um, but yeah, so Chagalani, who's like a, a Taylor and Winch sort of like a Vol Cafe the Swiss, Swiss owned company, they would probably be the ones who are buying the coffee that the other roasts in Australia are getting. Because mm-hmm. um, as far as I'm aware, I don't think there's there maybe some guys. In South Australia, who are bringing very small amounts in, but no one else is bringing in sort of commercial quantities. Um, and so, uh, but but Sippy Falls has got a pretty good reputation for quality. It's got a lot of those old school Kenyan varietals yeah. growing. The SL twenty eight alongside SL fourteen, which is the endemic Ugandan varietal, which is maybe a little bit typically less exciting, like mm-hmm. lower acidity, you know, kind of you know disease resistant. Um, uh, and so, keep your eye out for Sippy Falls. But other than that, maybe people will see uh, the. Bugisu coffee floating around, which again is Mount Algon. Um, but it would be again, probably purchased through like a Chugalani or a coffee com or like a big, um, uh, a big sort of coffee warehouse yeah. that would be buying regional coffee. So they would be like Sippy Falls is both a place and sort of a coffee region, but it would be comprised of like thousands of co- smallholder coffee producers. And if you buy Sippy Falls, it's probably from thousands of coffee producers and yeah. supplementary to that you said in the in the documentary how cool would it be if we didn't even tip if they didn't even need to sell coffee to common folk because they were the best coffee producers in uganda so like you know selling to people beyond yourself um and that's kind of it's already sort of reaching that direction is it not um yeah yeah well i mean, I mean not yeah. that you still buy some, get to a point <laughs> where you can't afford it uh, yeah i mean and that's kind of the goal because i think it's funny i talk to the the zakuka team all the time about like you know like i'm like oh like in their minds common folk is like you know the biggest restaurant in australia i'm like <laughs> I'm like, no, 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 we're like, we're small fry. Um, I mean, we love what we do and we, um, you know, we kind of have this focus of being, you know, a narrow focus to have bigger impact. But like in the end, if you guys want to be a successful business, you probably want to be selling to other roasters and roasters with super deep pockets. Um, but that's the goal. Um, I, I, the irony being, I reckon, you know, like hot take early on, like it's probably not going to be in Australia because we just don't want to pay that much for coffee or at least not for a container of coffee. Every, every roaster, you know, and his dog will pay, you know, top dollar for one bag, but no one's buying a fucking container of coffee that costs, you know, what it needs to cost for them to be super successful um, because we we deal in volumes of shit coffee. Yes, um, Australia. Rather than, yeah, yes, Australia, rather yeah. than like, you know, when you look at those countries, South Korea, Taiwan, like the the, the East Asian countries, you know, like they'll, they'll, they see coffee like as a luxury. And so like if you're doing specialty coffee, they're like, yeah, well, just buy what's the price. Yeah. yeah. I, I guess this is kind of the conversation we were having before the podcast. It's like we were talking about espresso martinis and how – for some reason, coffee has always got this label of something that in Australia that needs to be kind of at a certain price and it's our morning ritual and, you know, people don't see its status as beyond that. Uh, whereas like an espresso martini, you know, you just pay wave your thing and, you know, worry about the day after. Um, and I'm not saying I ever want coffee to be there, but we, we kind of find it difficult to shake that label. Yeah. And I mean, I think too, I've got, this is another hot take. I'm just all hot takes there. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Is that like... Not all coffee is created equal. So, like, it's unfair for us to be like, you know, if you're buying coffee from a big Brazilian plantation, you know, with hundreds of hectares and fully automated harvesting and agriculture, you can pay not much for it because actually the, the guys can be still making good money and it can be good business um, at, a, at scale and be cheap. But, mm. like, you, you're doing that, expecting the Ugandan farmers to somehow compete with that or the, thinking that's the same coffee or in the same ballpark is the issue. Yeah. And so I think that we just need to, you know, accept that some coffees should be being charged like cocktails and other coffees maybe can be two bucks from 7 Eleven. Just please don't use smallholder, you know, produced coffees to fill that $2 cup because it's going to be perpetuating really, really bad shit for a lot of people. And I guess the, this is a good say, segue into the next quote I wanted to discuss. For too long, coffee has been a nameless, faceless industry, with each step of the supply chain further removed from the human cost of the cup. So many hands touch the coffee before it ends up in your cup. So what do you, be, what do you mean by this and can you see it changing? Uh, well, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll respond to your question with a question. You know, like how many coffee roasters in Australia actually know or are actually in partnership with their producers. And I don't mean like have a photo of them that their importer gave them. <laughs> I mean like uh, have them on WhatsApp and are regularly talking to them. There, there are some that do. 
Mm. But most are just buying spot coffee or looking for the cheapest contract that they can get. Uh, and so... Is that rhetorical or a question? Four. What, well, yeah, how many? Five. <laughs> <laughs> I think at least five, but, <laughs> wouldn't be, but I think less than 100. I don't know. Um, Somewhere in that range, five to 100. Well, well not not enough. Enough. yeah, how could we know? Not, not enough. Yeah, yeah. Not well, enough. you wouldn't know because um, I think like here's my other, like I, I feel like a lot of, you know, companies that say that they're specialty coffee companies are actually marketing companies that occasionally roast specialty coffee. And so um, like in terms of like talking about like a nameless, faceless industry, it's like, well, you've got what the marketing company decides is, you know, a good story to tell. And then you've got the actual story that's not being told. Um, and so that's sort of what I mean by that. And I think that in terms of seeing it change, well, like, oh, sorry, I want to throw that out there. We're not doing, you know, everything super well like there's a lot of stuff we want to improve um, um in fact i think that the f what they say you know the first you know step of you know realizing you're an addict is like realizing you're saying you're an addict and like we, we're part of this system too and so like we we kind of like you know we're, we're saying hey everyone come and join us being shit um and we'll try and figure out how to fix it rather than going we're doing everything great and you guys are all shit no we're all shit mm. um the coffee the specialty coffee industry is not doing what it's supposed to do and we're trying to figure out how to fix it um but i think it's going to be very difficult because um you know like uh we're all guilty as charged and you know we thought it was going to be easy setting up direct connections with farmers but actually it's really complicated because it turns out there's no system or mechanism to really do that because that's not how the industry works. Um, most of coffee production is controlled by bigger companies. Um, it's very, very far removed. You can't just go to a smallholder farmer who maybe produces I don't know, like a thousand kilos of coffee and say, I want to buy your coffee. Um, it, that's That would be very, very challenging to do, especially for a small business. Um, and so we kind of need to come up with a better system for doing that. Yeah, absolutely. Can I, can I throw a contrarian? So the whole faceless, nameless kind of side of the industry, contrarian kind of side to it here. I see a lot of stuff where people like Rosas and that want to throw out a picture of a farmer or something about like, you know, the farm in Kenya or Ethiopia. And I think there's some people who care and it's good to have the traceability. But then there's also a lot of people who are buying the coffee who don't give a crap. They don't care about seeing a picture of a farmer or what the story is. One of the things that I love the most about common folk and what's kind of happening is you're creating a system that works, that supports the farmers, that does all that, and then you sell a cup of coffee and the person doesn't even have to know. They can just drink the coffee and they're supporting a better system. Obviously, you want to have some understanding of community and these guys are doing the right thing. But I, I think it's great that it's not thrown on the consumer that you have to do. It's like, hey, you can still do what you do every day and buy this cup of coffee, but it's doing better for the world out there. Yeah, no, you actually nailed it. And so, yeah, but maybe, and that's the point. I don't think we always blame the consumer. Australians aren't prepared to pay enough for coffee, this and that and everything. It was like, well, um, yes, I suppose that's how the economy works or whatever, but um, they're not the ones who know. Um, and so for us, it's more about sharing, you know, the, the truth or at least what we perceive to be sort of what's actually happening and then letting people have an opportunity because most consumers, like coffee is like people are just addicted to caffeine. They just want a coffee and if it's going to taste better, great. Um, like that's the reality and that's fine. Like it doesn't, not everyone's going to like start a coffee company and a charity in Uganda. Like that, that would be insane. <laughs> um, uh, but um, yeah, if we, we as the industry probably need to create um, better sort of feedback loops so that we're slowly fixing stuff. Like there's, there's like a lot of, you know, we're just starting to see it. I think now on social media and in the industry is people like sort of calling out the fact that, you know, like specialty coffee hasn't delivered on the promise. Like, um, that, that it's sort of said. And I think that that's part of the journey. And I think as well, just, um, I always tell my teams, like, not all coffee is created equal. Like, you know, we buy a great Brazilian coffee from one of our partners that is, you know, cheaper and enables us to like have wholesale accounts and then sell more as Kukabora, which is more expensive. So, you know, that's, I think that's a good thing. But I also know that it's, you know, a profitable business for them. So yeah. I'm not like, you know, I'm not screwing them over so that we can all be successful. So in that, do you hope that the value of paying what is a fair price is something that is embraced by these larger importers, thus making it easier for small coffee roasters to do it? No, I, like that, I, I just, no. Well, they just want to make money generally. I mean, they, they, you know, they might, it's like having big corporates. They all have like an ESG or like some sort of sustainability. You know, we, we, we get catering from a social enterprise sort of thing, but it's mostly there because 
someone on the board said that that's what you need to do because that's going to make you more appealing for people to work for so and like some more money. So genuine sort of thing. Well, it's not, it just isn't. Like I just, I've, just I've been around long enough. in that sense. And this kind of, this again kind of draws me back to our conversation with Caleb Holstein where it's like, well, may, maybe software like that um, kind of could serve as a disruptor to all this because you can actually sort of draw up um, I forget all the features of his software, but basically you'd be able to sort of enter an agreement with a producer from overseas, manage the logistics of it, so the traveling, the price, the contract, all those sort of things. Maybe things like that can sort of, you know, exclude those bigger companies in the future. Yeah, and again, like it's not because these bigger companies um, are inherently evil. It's just that their priority is not making it fair. Their priority is selling coffee. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, if like Green Square or something like that could um, could do that, that would be amazing. And I think too that there's been um, – there hasn't been a huge amount of movement in this space because of how challenging it is and because you're competing with massive, massive companies – who, and with complicated things like moving, uh, you know, like a, a agricultural product across multiple countries' borders and dealing with imports and shipping companies and all this kind of stuff. And, you know, like it's not the kind of thing that like a little cafe owner, you know, just goes, oh, yep, I'm going to wake up one day and just do that stuff. Mm. Sorry, yep. Go ahead. Well, I was, I was going to draw a comparison to Australian dairy if I could. So, I mean, before oh, everyone- before Another I, comparison to Australian dairy. You well, managed you know to squeeze Kirk it in. used to work in dairy? <laughs> oh, well, this is why. Right. So, I'm not, I'm not going into bat for the dairy industry. Well, I'm they call him the milkman. But it is why they call me the milkman. But, but there's an there's a interesting microeconomic sort of comparison that we can make here. And so, we in Australia, I cannot speak for other countries, but in Australia, there was a big sort of issue for a, a number of years where, you know, the price of milk was essentially cheap than water at the supermarket. Um, and so because there was a price war between supermarkets, thank you very much, very gentlemanly. Speaking of, there's some expensive water for you. Yeah, there's the some cup. expensive water for you. Um, Sam just poured me a glass of water. But, That's but, like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but But what I guess what happened was, so there was X amount of farmers that supplied to the supermarkets. So it's just kind of like these, uh, these people that kind of affect the market to store the market and also kind of dictate what they pay to producers. Um, and so what's happened 10 years later is that, and you know, alongside with all that, they deal with all this other bullshit like drought and climate um, conditions and all those sorts of things. So you can, you can see why farmers thinking, which is, this is a tough time. Fast forward 25, uh, sorry, 10 years later, and 25% of Australian dairy producers have left the industry. And so now we're paying record amounts for, for dairy. And, you know, there's, 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 it's not just milk, there's your know, cream that goes into essential goods, there's butter that goes cheese, into baby. cheese and you know makes you croissants all those sorts of things so you know you own a business you've seen the price of milk spike so what's happened is the farm gate price for coffee has just gone up uh, a lot uh maybe more than 25 percent, i guess um and then so the comparison i make is perhaps to coffee now it's like if we don't go down this path of, of having these conversations and sort of investing more or paying more for coffee We'll be doing it anyway, but it, it be in a way that's involuntary. So, yeah, your thoughts on that? Yeah, and, and, and you're right. A coffee will, like, just by inertia, like, you know, like supply and demand, that's how business works. The only problem is, for me, the human collateral damage of that, say, compared to dairy. And, and, and like, I mean, you know how, how fucked the dairy industry is. And, like, there are people who probably lost their lives because of how messed up it got. A lot got. of them took their own yeah. lives. Um, but if I look at the coffee context, you know, okay, imagine what you've just said. But in an emerging economy, without any welfare, without supportive government, with coffee being at the time, possibly for a lot of these smallholders, the only cash crop that they can really operate with. Um, and we're literally talking no possible way for them to navigate this if all of a sudden, and this is why climate change, the climate crisis is such a big deal with coffee too, because you're going to have all these people who's like you know, 125 million people you know, rely on coffee for their livelihood. And I think about 40 million of them are smallholder farmers. And these people can't compete. And, and even if coffee goes up, you know who's going to be making the money? It is going to be the bigger Brazilian or Colombian or Vietnamese estates that are sort of corporately owned because they're going to benefit from coffee becoming a scarce commodity, but they're still going to be producing it um, for a lot less and a lot more profitably than smallholders. Um, and that that's going to be the issue. And then what are these people going to do? Like they don't have... There's no other option um, for a lot of them. Um, and so, yes, some of them will leave the industry. Some of them will just stay in poverty. And so there's no one there supporting them. Like if you're a dairy farmer and you had to sell the family farm and get the fuck out of a dying industry, um, worst case scenario, 
the Aussie government will prop you up until you get another job. Well, I mean, the Australian, I guess, um, negative outcome from that is probably like we're a we, we we're a massive agricultural economy, and so you know, food scarcity becomes an issue. And I guess you know, coffee. It if we if we go down that same path, it will have the same impact. It'll become more scarce and more expensive. And like I was saying, it'll become more expensive anyway, whether we like it or not. And that's why that's why I think this is all so important. This is such an important message. This doco, such an important message. Mm. But the big question is, how are you getting this doco out? Yeah, Where are you hey, pushing hey, this hey, doco? Hey, are you going to do some TikTok dances? Are you going to chuck some random stuff in your porter filter? How are you going to get that message out? Um, oh, there's this little podcast called It's Just Coffee. So I'm hoping that, like, yeah, it's pretty good. Um, so um, where this is sort of the, you know, I'm doing the media junket now. I think this is, this is the media junket. <laughs> the media this will be tour. It. Yeah, the media tour. Um, we're going to do a couple of screenings. So we're doing a local one down in Mornington on Friday the 30th of August. Um, it's going to be at the Peninsula Community Theatre. Um, Wait, what date was that again? Friday the 30th of August. And where? Um, at the Peninsula Community Theatre in, in Mornington. In Mornington. Um, so we'll do a city one. We haven't planned it yet. If yeah. anyone has a venue they'd like to screen it in, uh, hit me up. But we're also doing one in Sydney for all those Sydney listeners out there. In fact, we're doing two. Um, We've got a lot of Sydney listeners. Oh, wow. Sydney loves the pod. Mm -hmm. um, uh, at one at uh, Vivcore Trading, um, which is one of our amazing corporate partners. They're in an incredible um, supporter of, of the Cup Accounts and what Common Folk has been doing. Um, and that's on Wednesday, the 7th of August. Um, and then we're doing one at Canva Space. At, um, Canva basically own all of Surrey Hills and there's a space there um, uh, on Friday the 9th. Um, and there'll be details of that um, available uh, through the Cup Accounts website, but also like I'm guessing in the show notes or whatever you guys Yeah, there. we'll put that in the show notes there, all the dates. So if you want to find it out right now, just jump into the and show we'll, notes. We'll make sure we spread it as much as we can as well. Legends. And then of course, you know, after we've done the premier screenings, we'll host it somewhere on the internet. So, it, and it's going to be free. I don't to charge anyone for this. Are you taking it to the Cannes Film Festival? Well, I, you know, uh, yeah, maybe. I don't know if they're kind of ritzy enough for this yeah, documentary. Right. That's yeah, right. That's fair enough. Um, yeah, fair we enough. probably will. We want to enter it into a few competitions, mostly mm -hmm. for like Danny's sakes. He's done such an incredible job for, <laughs> you know, for what was essentially two flights to Uganda. Um, we kind of want to spruik it because I think that he's his ability to tell stories um, both visually and then like, you know, just through the content is incredible. And so I think that um, there's probably other – Stories, maybe coffee stories that should be shared in a similar format. And um, yeah, so we want to make this as accessible as we can. So, you know, stay tuned. I don't know if it'd be YouTube or Vimeo. Or I, I, that's not my foray. Maybe Liam will have some suggestions. <laughs> well, I want to ask you some questions. Now, now that the documentary is essentially finished and you're doing the media tour and all that sort of stuff, and so you can reflect on you know, the contents of it, what's one example of... Uh, of the improvement in the lives of those residents on Mount, Mount Elgon that you're particularly proud of? Um, we try and tell really personal stories, um, like small stories, because I think that, that hones in on the human side of this rather than like the big ones because we could go on about the 1,500 farmers that now get paid three times what they were and the 200 employees and all that kind of stuff. But I want to talk to you about um, Kasim. So he was basically a day labourer working at the Meander wet mill, um, lifting, carrying basic sort of tasks. He couldn't read or write. Um, pretty typical actually of like a, you know, like a, a young man living on Mount Algon, you know, one of these rural villages. Um, he didn't have any meaningful employment outside of the harvest either. So it was just casual work every time Zakuka Bora were there doing stuff. Um, and through that connection over the years and over Zakuka's growth, um, he, uh, oh, and he could, yeah, and he couldn't read or write, so he couldn't like kind of handle cash or finance. But now he's the site manager of, of one of Zakuka's largest buying sites, um, in Balago. Um, he also holds the record for processing the largest ever single buying day for Zakuka Bora recording, I think over nine tons of cherry, um, in one day. Um, and managing all of that, including the team, the cash payments and delegating all the responsibilities to kind of get that to the wet mill. Um, and without Zakuka Bora, he just, he literally wouldn't have a job let alone a career. Um, and so um, that's that's probably one of the stories we like to reflect on because there are 200 other examples of that. Um, and then obviously the 1,500 other examples of people who've benefited and then 20,000 direct dependents, you know, in these communities that before Zakuka Bora were there were just kind of kicking on. That had to be the highlight of me watching that doco as well, just getting to that point. And I thought the doco was really well structured because it kind of was the process of your entire journey. Started off with the idea, how it was built up here, how it moved uh, to Uganda, and then that kind of effect that it played on. Uh, and watching the excitement of talking about working with that coffee and the processing, all those different elements uh, was a joy to watch. So highly recommend it. 
and and this is one of those moments that we talk about now. It's like part of me wants to clap, but part of me, the other part of me is also is like, well, hang on, maybe that's just the standard. Like that's an amazing story, but it's like imagine how much more we can do across other continents by you know making more impactful choices as roasters, as consumers, as baristas, all those sorts of things. And does that ring a bell for you? Like, do, is this something you'd like to see spread more? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, like we've we've been talking about this. So we, we Zakukabora, its success is in part because there was a great team on the ground. So you know, the connection with with Jenga, which was a community development organization, already doing good work, just not in coffee. You know, having them there, and then having someone like Dave, who was prepared to volunteer, you know, literally his time, his life, his whole family moved to Uganda to do this. Um, you know, it was kind of key. And so we're kind of, we, we all, I, get, I reckon every year I get like two or three um, people come to me like, oh, you should do this project over here. And and really the first question I ask is like, great. And who's who's doing it with us? Because, mm. we you know, we're, we can resource it and we can maybe buy the coffee, but who are the people who, who are prepared to sacrifice everything to make sure that, you know, these the farmers usually um, benefit in the long run and not just for like one year. On that note, what's next do you think for Zakukabora? Because we, you, what, some one thing that struck me and I definitely wanted to ask uh, earlier is that you said like um, saying something about Zakukabora and, you know, that becoming like a superstar processor or uh, producer, I guess you'd say, in the likes of um, Esmeralda. Like what, what do you see that's next for them? Like can you – is there some sort of new processing that will get them to that level? Because I – like some one thing we all debate a lot is anaerobic processing, for example. It's like sometimes it's not always the best for, for coffee, but sometimes it really brings the best out in some coffees, When to be frank with it. Like do you see – like something like Sasha Sestich has done with CM, like – yeah. Do you see yourselves being able to do something like that, having like an exclusive from Zakukabora that everyone kind of knows that's like that coffee that comes out that time each year, we should all enjoy it? Yeah, I think so. Um, uh, and, and we've already had a lot of success there. So um, as I said earlier, like the SL14 varietal, which is sort of the endemic and certainly the most, you know, readily sort of produced varietal on Mount Algon is, um, you know, Sometimes a little bit lackluster, like it's good, but it's, you know, but sometimes it's not great. Um, but actually it takes really, really well to, to natural processing and to anaerobic fermentation. Mm. Um, I think you get a lot of really fun tropical fruit, tropical fruit, you know, like kind of like, you know, like a, a, a fun cocktail sort of like, you know, like kind of vibes going on. Um, and, and to the point where we have customers who are like, you know, kind of going, Oh, when are you releasing the, the sippy natural again? Yeah. Because, you know, all the unicorn, which was like a Baduda natural, cause they kind of like, they're hankering for that flavor, which is relatively unique. Um, but then also like where, um, I mean, so Zakuka needs to be resourced to produce those coffees, uh, better and in a more controlled environment. And so that's a big push this year is we're trying to raise money. In fact, you know, we almost raised all of it to kind of, um, improve, uh, a processing side, in particular drying and experimental processing uh, down in the Mbale Township where they've got, you know, like sort of their roastery and, you know, kind of a lot of their drying space because that will control, you know, is everything. And if you can control the temperature and the pH and all of that sort of stuff, you can start, you know, replicating a process, a proprietary process. And and that's definitely part of it. Um, and then also, you know, to do that, they need space so that we can bring in more coffee to Australia. So we're, you know, this year was the first year we really, really engaged with trying to get other roasters on board and so um i'll shout them out because like you know i feel like you know early adopters like you yeah, know nice. taking a risk but like you know we've sold coffee um this year to five senses um diggy doos paulie there ratio bought a stack um long shot up in core um vacation proximal path pillar i probably missed a few but um i guess i better buy some oh, i'd like to say <laughs> <laughs> yeah, hey, hey, no, i said it out. first golden brown <laughs> coffee what we sold, sold out. out sorry yeah but we're taking why the hell are you here get the hell out of my shop <laughs> but i guess about I yeah. guess that's the that's the end goal though, right? Yeah, so yeah, that's awesome. it. Congrats. So that's it. We want to like, and, and one thing we're going to push for people partnering with us is like, we're going to go, okay, well, if you want this coffee, which like it turns out a lot of people do, you got to pre-commit to it because we're going to give you, well, we'll give you a better price like legitimately because I think that there has to be some reward for roasters who are prepared to stick their neck out and go, you know what? Sippy Natural, put me down for a pallet. Um, and I'm like, cool, well, we'll give it to you for this price if you sign this contract. And I know that like every importer, you know, will offer contracts, but seriously, like most small roasters just don't do contracts. And I'm like, well, our farmers, like we've already paid for the coffee. Lock it in, pay, <laughs> so yeah. So pay for it. Um, and, then, uh, and then also get in early because hopefully like, you know, there's not going to be enough to go around. Mm. Well, that kind of makes my next question a bit hard because I was going to say, we've taken a lot of information here. There's a lot of stuff that's been coming, but I was going to say, what can... Roasters, cafes, whatever, are listening to this right now. 
what can they do? I was going to say just buy some of the coffee, but obviously that's not it. They can pre-commit to the next yeah, round. Yeah, well, roasters pre-commit. So get in touch with Tommy and myself um, yep. and, and let us know you're interested in trying this for next year. Um, but you can still buy the roasted products. So we'll be uh, releasing basically weekly, you know, and use the Kookaburra coffee. Um, so uh, we're, we're actually, we're doing the Thieves uh, coffee subscription uh, in August and it's going to be all Zakuka as well. So we're going awesome. to- Can I ask, um, h- how do we get in contact with you? Um, great. Well, uh, I, I, again, show notes, I assume you'll leave my contact details. Please do. Um, you can do it for our website. Um, can you we can, just get your mobile number? Yeah, just I'll, read it I'll put right my now. mobile number. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, 1-800-SAM-KEK. That's not oh, my number. That's is. probably someone's number, but don't call that because you won't so get So are there socials? Email. Common- yeah. Socials, common fa- are we actually, because we have a few venues. Um, each venue has its own Instagram because I feel like our coffee customers don't want to be spammed with like, you know, sandwich photos. Um, but con- at Common Folk Coffee is our Insta. Um, um, DMS, like really, you know, like anyway, uh, carrier pigeon, whatever. We'll, you put it, we'll put it all in the show notes so that it's there for everyone to find. Also, what a fun name to say. Zakukabora. Yeah. I just want to Zucucabora. say it. Zakukabora. Uh, You've answered a lot of the questions that I was going to ask next already. So I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead and give yeah. you some, some personal Sam Keck ones. What's something you'd like? So this is unrelated to anything we've spoken about really now. This is something I want to ask most of the guests or if not all of them as they come on. What's something you want people to remember you by? I was, I did, I did some podcast planning, um, with the team because I, I felt like I, it was my obligation to tell all of our story well. And then there was like all these personal questions. So I'm like, what do you guys think I want to be remembered by? Um, and I think that the, the number one thing was good choice in Crocs. Probably the number yeah, one. Okay. Well, can we get, this is a little awkward. Can we get you to stand up for a second? For the people watching at home, if you're just listening, this is an ad to, to go in. Can we look at that? So we got some blue Crocs. What do we got in the, the tip right there? That's such a Gen Z thing. Yeah. That's a, that's amazing. I do. I kind of have for our whole office wanted to just buy everyone their own individual pair of Crocs that you can kind of come in the office, whip them on. Do you not have a golden brown gibbet? I just need to get you one. Mate, that's, that's little like, hat, it's dude, like the little logo is made I'm for I'm on it. Alibaba and then just away you go. 10 times profit. You're mate. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This is, Look, we've just talked about all the ways that we can help farmers. And, it's like, <laughs> and then we need to go to some sweatshops here, here and I get am, some here, logos. Here I am. <laughs> Asking you all these deep philosophical questions, and, I, and my response, and the response you give is Crocs. Hell yeah! Well, what well a done. response! Um, um, no, I did have a serious answer, but like I okay. feel like uh, this podcast's been serious, and I'm not. I'm actually not a super serious guy. Like this was the other part of the doco is like it's been really fun doing this, um, and like you said, by a, like perpetual motion or whatever, the impact continues to happen, and I can be stupid and have fun, <laughs> you know, making coffee and 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 talking to people and being in community, um, but also hopefully not screwing people over, um, but. Genuinely, what did I say? Um, well, no, just being a, maybe a positive example of what you can do in coffee. Like, we don't necessarily think we'll ever be the biggest coffee roastery in the world. I mean, if it happens, you know, it's hard for me to visualize what that would look like, but we'd love to be held up as an example. Um, of what you can do and maybe, you know, a bit of an aspirational business. It's like, yeah, yeah. Have you tried the common folk coffee? You know, have you tried the, the sippy natural? It's super good. You know, you should try it. And you know, those guys like, you know, really were involved in that process and we can buy that next year or, you know, that, that's what I'd like. Oh, boring. <laughs> Bring back the Crocs. Oh, wow. What a <laughs> No, that is amazing. That is, uh, and I think you will be remembered by that, especially after this pod. Uh, I'm blown away by what you guys have done. I think it's amazing. And uh, honestly, I, I kind of foresee in the next couple of years, Sippy Fall, some sort of Sippy Falls co- um, coffee being either like a 90 point or like even a competition winning lot. Yeah, a hundred percent. I mean, again, like you, um, I think in the show notes you haven't touched on it, but Rubens Gardelli has been doing some work there too. And he mm. actually, um, and his coffee is incredible. I've tried it. Um, yeah, project. yeah, I tried it. Um, I tried it alongside some Zucuco and I actually yeah, think yeah. the Zucuco oh. was better. And well, that was the coffee that won the Brewers' Cup. Oh, are, you, yeah. are you committing right now to using Zakuka in your barista championship? Never, routine? never say never. Never say go. never. Um, all right. Last question I had for you before we move on to everyone's two favorite segments. <laughs> Name one person dead and one person alive you would like to have coffee with. Your live one's really easy. Um, Sir David Attenborough, he's oh, basically yeah. my hero. Oh, yes. um, I, uh, I actually have a zoology degree and it was mostly because I wanted to follow in his footsteps and oh, fly what? around the world filming nature documentaries. And the irony being, I get to fly around the world filming coffee documentaries in but, the same countries. Well, 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 David right. Beanenbrough. <laughs> All right. And uh, who would you have that's no longer with us? Um <laughs> Bit of a host personally, Anthony Bourdain. Um, I love him. His philosophy. He's just a legend, yeah. and I feel like he'd be 
easy to convince um, to watch this doco and get on board with that kind of coffee because it seems like the kind of thing he'd be frothing. Also, just like Two to great have answers. Yeah. Two great answers. Well, uh, on that note, we're going to move on to everyone's second favorite segment of all time. This is the rapid fire question. So everything everything you've kind of been able to prepare for, but this is the one that you cannot prepare for. So Liam. Oh, golly. Hopefully it's not as just roasting me as last week, but I hope it kind of is as well. I loved it. Hey, hey it's just questions. Are you ready? No. Oh. Go for it. And your time starts now. Washed or natural? Natural. Espresso or filter? Espresso. Hot summer's day, what are you drinking? Natural wine. Team Edward or Jacob? Oh, Jacob. Favorite Star Wars film? Um, the one with Jar Jar Binks. Worst Star Wars film? Uh, uh, the Empire Strikes Back. Do you think Jimmy Butler should come on the podcast? Absolutely. Is Rowan looking a bit thick to you? Breaded. <laughs> LeBron or MJ? MJ. Perfect to copy, yes or no? Yes. Are you good at chess? Average. Average. Uh, favorite podcast? Just coffee. White chicks or legally blonde? Oh, I thought that was going to be a very different question. <laughs> <laughs> legally blonde? Lance or Hoffman? Hoffman. Best cafe of all time? Uh, auction rooms. Cake or pastry? Pastry. Gasher with an eye or no eye? With an eye. Favorite country to visit? Uganda. Two more questions to go, but I, w- I really want to get your answer to them. Charmander, Bulbasaur, or Squirtle? Bulbasaur. Goku or Vegeta? Goku. Okay. Oh, uh, that's, not, yeah. that's not too bad. Yeah, boy. Yeah, yeah boy. Wait. That's Geisha, really stressful. Geisha with an I. Is that uh, the controversial one? Yeah. No, well, yeah. You just want to stick to the Japanese roots of an Ethiopian no. coffee? Well, well, no. My argument being that that's how it was. Ma- the Geisha is a marketing exercise and that's yeah. how it was originally marketed. So, like, it's sort of like a badge of shame for all the people who, you know, like. Oh, uh, you want to just hold yeah. them accountable yeah. to their shame. Like, yeah. just keep the name because of these horrible. Stop using Geisha for so- brewing competitions. It's cheating. You know, be creative. Use the sippy natural. Uh, oh, there you go. Sorry, oh, he brings it around. It all comes back around. I'm just, oh uh, I'm just that promoting was, Uganda. That's it. I'm, that I'm was, on my mission. That was so quick. You answered, answered those so fast. It was like shredding rubber. It was just steaming up in here. Yeah. It's well, when you, when you has around, anyone done that to you, though, Kirk? Cr- like, I feel like you need to be put through that. Put through what? The, the 20 questions in oh, the one yeah, minute. He oh, has, yeah, he has done it though. But you're welcome to. But now to we need again. to do it with more of a roast and oh. get it hot. Yeah, well, you know, all that <laughs> friction created some serious heat in here. I don't know if I can handle it, Rowan. <laughs> I think it's time for an extra hot take, take with, with two, two sugars. sugars. It's a hot take. Two sugars. Uh, um, we always get the guest to outline their extra hot take with two sugars uh, first. So, Liam, which camera? We, we, Sam Kek, right, down so the we, barrel. So, down the barrel, my, your extra hot would take with two sugars. Take it away. Why is it that baristas who exclusively drink natural wine also only like washed coffees? Oh, great question! That's, yeah. an, that's an extra hot take with two sugars because they, they like the, it's they they play in the same field. No, I don't like the natural coffees, but I'll drink a Patrick Sullivan Vino wine pet nat. I'll drink like, a big hay bale in a glass, but then I need my coffee clean. I made filter that washed coffee through, you know, like a unbleached paper filter. But uh, that wine, if it doesn't taste like my brother's footy sock after losing the grand final, I don't want to drink it. Well, that's a, that is a great one. That is a great one. Um, hypocrites. The Barista pa- paradox. Who, who have you got? Like, have you got one at work that like is Alex Blair? One of the, hey, Alex the worst? Blair. Shout out to the group head barista. Yes, that's his title, and the fact that I've just said that on it's just coffee will make him weep for days. But yeah. his title. <laughs> is, is he bring it up to him. Go in the shop. Group head barista. Is he that um, guy? The washed, but. Actually, Alex is like, he's pretty, he's pretty humble drinker. Like he'll drink anything. He obviously loves, you know, the fancy stuff, the natural wines, but, um, but he also loves funky coffees. Yeah. No. He loves wash coffees, but he no. loves funky coffees. So I, well, I won't judge him, but you know, he, he, he will look down his nose on you if you're like, you know, ordering something shit though. Okay. All right. That, and to be honest, that's fair. My extra hot take with two sugars is also taking a shot at baristas. So my extra hot take, can I go, can I go to this one? My extra hot take with two sugars is more of a question. Baristas, why do you all love rock climbing? <laughs> they all do it. They all do it. It's like, it's, I call it the national barista pastime, kind of like baseball in America. 
it, seriously, if you know a barista or if you are a barista, like 50 to 75% of your friends, they actively do bouldering. Okay, it's, well, I was just about to call you out there. They're, they're, also, they're the Maddie Wine drinkers too. It's, the same, it's yeah, exactly yeah, yeah. the same It's cabal. It's cabal. Please, it's bouldering. It's like, you know, some people might rock climb, but the biggest side that we're talking about here is uh, is bouldering. Who have we got in the house? Oh, we got uh, Son Diddy so, just in Son the back. Son loves a boulder. Mate, you know who else loves a boulder? Oh, don't do it. This guy. Oh, yeah, yeah. boy. Oh, They're no going to be calling me no Jabba the Hutt. We're going up. The only reason I'm a bouldering <laughs> at the moment is because I have like a, a spiky bone fragment in my hand from mm. bouldering that I need yeah. to get removed. Well, there you go. Um, but I will say as A, the reason why they do it is great community. The people there are so inviting, so loving. I feel like people who work in that hospitality industry are all about community. Great way rather than just going out and getting boozed off your mind mm. to go and hang out with friends, chat, get some exercise in, challenge yourself. Uh, I find it's really good for like, you find a lot of scientists and tech people also do it. I think there's this problem solving side to it uh, that's really great. But I will say to your question to prove it further, I'm never recognized more from the videos than when I go bouldering, yeah. even like internationally, even like some dude from like Chile, like coming up to me and he's like, I just arrived two days ago in Australia and Mr. Golden Brown is here. Yeah. <laughs> Who knew I'd find him at a girl at a bouldering, <laughs> bouldering gym. gym. No, no, seriously. I want to do a study that sort of recognizes the, um, what's the, what's the word? The correlation between yep. being a barista and going bouldering regularly. Yep. It's a thing. I also think a lot of the interesting side of like tech and uh, science and that would be another one in there. Yeah, okay. Like the thinking person's CrossFit. Yeah. Uh, now the king of hot takes himself. Take I got away. a hot take for you. All right. Hot take with two sugars right here. Stop going on and on about milk texture. Just make it the same texture for every drink. Just pour it in. And I'm half of the coffees are in takeaway cups anyway. Who cares? If you're doing a cappuccino, it's sticking to the lid. It's foamy. You just want a nice, thin, silky milk. Anyone drinking cappuccinos or anything else, shut the hell up. Just serve all the same milk. Oh, I love it. I, and I, I, we need to do away with this whole, like, you don't really know or care. You know? Yeah, you don't know or care. It's all. I challenge you to like kind of taste the difference. We'll do like three different foam amounts in takeaway cups and see what kind of difference that you're seeing and what you like. Also, imagine the the speed in that when you're working with baristas. Now, granted, a barista if they're doing a cap and a flat white probably steams it, pours the cap first for more and a flat white second. But if you're just smashing them out one after the other, the same consistency and also just a better consistency. Most customers just think there's a cappuccino button on the machine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, <laughs> just press the cappuccino button. This is actually where I first got introduced to Rowan Cook, actually, because you shared a video back like two or three years ago saying, they're all the same. Yeah. Uh, we, need to, we need to reshare that. We need to get that going again. That was my exposure to Rowan Cook. That's how I first uh, was introduced to your law. Yeah. And um, yeah, great extra hot take. Bringing it back awesome. here. I like it. Uh, well, that just about wraps up today's show. I mean, is there anything else that you didn't get in that you wanted to mention, Sam Keck? That was, that's been a great one. I think so. Um, thanks for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Yeah, and it's it's truly like an honor when you're doing like this podcast to have people on that are doing something great to hear their story. So thank you so much for coming by the studio. Well, actually, you know, that's the one. Let me. Yeah, I do have something else to say. I did. I did very very little. Um, it's been a massive team effort across the board. So no, it was just you. Yeah. No. No. It, 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 I don't know. Um, but yeah, like seriously, like the, all of the team is the Kookaburra, all of the Colin Folk team, like our, our staff volunteer so much time to the Cut the Counts sort of initiative. Like no one's ever been paid for any of this, the extra stuff we do. And so like, um, I guess I'm standing on the shoulders of and heaps of baristas and, you know, other good people, you know, my family, my wife, my kids. You're just a beautiful face that's here representing. That's it. I'm just like a talking head. Yeah. <laughs> I'm actually the robot that's replacing all the baristas. I'm not real. <laughs> this is AI. But yeah, no, but seriously, thank you for taking the time to come out and do this podcast and contribute to our show. And, um, you know, we wish you all the best of luck with what you're going on to do. And we'll- Sam Eversus, I believe is the name, right? Yeah, Sam Eversus. Right. So, um, yeah. Um, so seriously, good luck with the, the tour and we'll do the best we can to help make Make sure that people know about this documentary as well. Check out the documentary. Check all the show notes to get all the details about where you can see it, about how to get in contact with them. And if you want to get in contact with us, you can reach out at hello at it's just coffee pod. 
www.thepodcastpodcast.com. Any questions, any hot takes, send them our way. We can't wait to hear from you. And again, Sam Keck, thank you for dropping by. As yeah. always. Oh, I f***ed it. Yes. As always. It's, it's just, just coffee. coffee. Sam Keck, everybody. <laughs> You have to bleep me out on that one.